And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them, that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. Follow, um, sorry. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. But you have held fast to the Lord your God. But you who have who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do them in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them. For that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? Whenever we call upon him. And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Thanks, Lorinda. Uh, on my wedding day, I promised to love Alice. Uh, it wasn't a very difficult promise to make. All I had to do was say, all that I am, I give to you, and all that I have, I share with you. I will serve you with tenderness and respect and encourage you to develop God's gift in you. Whatever the future holds, I will love you and strengthen you as long as we both shall live. That's not too hard to say. I even memorised it back then, although I haven't memorised it now. The difficult part is actually doing it. And doing it not just for the remainder of your wedding day, but for the rest of your life. In the same way, when you become a Christian, you don't just promise to love Jesus on Sundays. You promise to love Jesus on Monday at work, and later in the week when you go shopping, and next month when you're feeling a little bit unwell, or next year when you go on your big trip. When you promise to love Jesus, you promise to love him for the rest of your life. And when you say that you love Jesus, you're not just expressing a sentimental feeling, but a commitment to him. To love Jesus means giving him all that you are and all that you have. It means serving him and obeying him. When asked what the greatest commandment in the whole Bible, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Deuteronomy is all about what it means to love God with all of your heart. I'm actually calling this series Walking with the Lord. And I called it that for three reasons. Firstly, because it comes straight out of Deuteronomy. Moses says, you shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you. Deuteronomy calls us to walk with the Lord. Secondly, because walking implies a relationship. Deuteronomy can feel like a big, long list of rules. But more than most other books in the Bible, Deuteronomy is concerned with loving God from the heart. It, it talks about our heart, uh, I think, the third amount out of every book of the Bible. I think only the Psalms and one other book, one John, talks about the heart more. We walk with God because we love God in our hearts. Thirdly, because walking implies obedience. We walk in all the ways that God has commanded us. To walk with God means living God's way. So in this series, we're going to be looking at what it means to walk with God every single day of our lives. Now, now Deuteronomy is a huge book. It's pretty daunting to preach a series on Deuteronomy. One of the commentaries I've got is based on a sermon series by Douglas Kelly. 
Uh, he did Deuteronomy in 74 sermons. Uh, John Calvin did it in 200 sermons. I'm going to try to do it in 20. So if you think that's too long, it could be a lot longer. Just want to put that out there. The Greek name Deuteronomy means second law. Uh, we call it that because it's the second time the Ten Commandments appear in the Bible. First in Exodus and then in Deuteronomy again. The Hebrew name was Debarim, which means the words. And it's particularly the words of Moses. It's a good name because Deuteronomy is pretty much five speeches that Moses gives. Uh, I've actually highlighted those up on the board there. So they're the five speeches, the yellow, the green, the light blue, the pink and the red. So they're the five big speeches in the uh, book of Deuteronomy. For the sake of brevity, I'm going to summarise the first three chapters very quickly and then we're going to start in chapter four. Throughout this series, I'm going to tackle every section, but not every verse from every section. We're just going to do a few chunks, otherwise we will be here for our 74 weeks. So. Deuteronomy starts with Moses reminding God's people of where they've been. How God commanded them to leave Mount Sinai and enter the promised land and how they refused and had to wander the wilderness for 40 years. But now they're again on the edge of the promised land and Moses undertook to explain God's law to them. And after summarising the last 40 years, uh, Moses starts chapter 4. And now, O uh, Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. Moses proclaims God's word to God's people. Deuteronomy is pretty much a, a sermon. And this morning, as we begin our series on Deuteronomy, I want to reflect not on Moses' words, but what they really are, the words of the Lord. These words aren't just Moses' words to God's people on the edge of the Jordan River. They are God's words to you and to me today. And I want to look at three things this morning. Firstly, what God wants us to do with his word. Secondly, the danger of not doing God's word. And finally, the benefits of doing God's word. So firstly, what should you and I do with the word of the Lord? When you read Deuteronomy for yourself, what should you do with it? When I preach to you Deuteronomy, what does God want you to do with what I'm saying? Well, from our text this morning, God wants you to do four things. Firstly, he wants you to listen to his word. Moses says, and now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. That word listen is used over a thousand times in the Old Testament and over 90 times in Deuteronomy. God wants you and me to listen to his word. Back at Mount Sinai, God told Moses to gather the people to me that I may let them hear my voice or my words. In fact, at Mount Sinai, God's people didn't just hear God's words mediated through Moses, they actually heard God's voice. Moses says, The Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form. There was only a voice. Later, Moses reminds God's people, out of heaven, the Lord let you hear his voice. You heard his words out of the midst of the fire. God's people had literally heard God speak to them. But the problem is they refused to listen. Moses says, I spoke to you and you would not listen, but you rebelled against the command of the Lord. That's why over and over in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses calls us to listen to God's voice. He says, probably one of the most famous passages in the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Are you listening to God's word? 
Have you heard that our Lord is one? Have you heard God's call to love him with all of your heart, soul and mind? God is calling you and me to listen to his word this morning. In fact, Moses calls us to listen to Jesus. He says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. It is to him you shall listen. Jesus actually says this, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. The prophet that we are to listen to is none other than Jesus himself. Obviously all of God's prophets, but mostly Jesus. Because Jesus is not just a prophet, he's God's son. When Jesus is transfigured or reveals his glory before his disciples, God says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The letter of Hebrews says, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In Jesus, we get to hear the good news. We get to hear that God has come down into our world in the person of Jesus Christ. We get to hear that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We get to hear that through faith in Jesus, you and I can be forgiven, can be reconciled with God and can receive eternal life. Jesus is calling to you and me this morning. But are we listening to him? But when the Bible calls us to listen to God's word, it expects that we then go on to do God's word. Moses says, And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you and do them. There's no point listening to God unless you go on and do what he says. In verse 5, Moses says, See, I have taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them. The very next verse, he adds, Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding. The point of God giving us commands and statutes and rules is that we would do them, that we would obey them, that we would walk in them, that we would live by them. In fact, often the word listen is translated as obey. Later in chapter 4, the ESV says, return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. In the Hebrew, it's listen to his voice. But the ESV is right to translate it as obey because that's the point of listening to God, that we would do what he says. Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man. A fool ignores the words of God. But a wise person obeys what God says. A wise person does the words of God. Thirdly, Moses says, we're not to change God's word. Verse 2, you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you. The point is that God's word perfectly reflects God's character and God's will. To add to God's word is to suggest that it's not enough. That God hasn't given us everything that we need that we need to add something extra. To take from God's word is to suggest that God got it wrong, that his words aren't important. And we are so tempted to add to or take up from God's word. We need to be so careful that our doctrines faithfully reflect God's word and aren't a reflection of our personal preferences. We need to be so careful that we don't make the Bible say what we want it to say. And how often do we prefer certain things weren't in the Bible? 
It would be so much easier if the Bible never said anything about a husband's leadership or headship or about divorce or sexual immorality or about hell. But if God has spoken, his words matter. Our job is not to decide which words we like or don't like. Our job is to decide what God is saying and how that applies to our lives. We are to listen and do all of God's word, not just the bits we like. Finally, Moses says we're to keep God's word in our hearts. Verse 9, Moses says, Only take care and keep your soul diligent the things that your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. The emphasis lies on that final bit. Moses' concern is that God's word would remain in our hearts. Later, he says, these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. And later still, you shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart. The idea of God's word being in your heart means more than just memorising it. It's not just about being in your head. It means more than just obeying it. It means loving it. God's word in your heart means to allow God's word to change our hearts so that we would love the things that God loves. That we would see the world as God sees it. That we would see other people as God sees them. (coughs) It's only when God's word penetrates our hearts that we can truly hear what God is saying and that we're able to do what he says. Moses says in Deuteronomy 18, I think I know Deuteronomy 30. The word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. Only when God's word is in our hearts are we able to do his word. To walk with the Lord starts by keeping his word in your heart. So, So how do you do that? Well, let's look at two things Moses says in verse. Moses says, take care to guard your soul. The Hebrew word means to guard it. It actually uses the same word three times in like eight words. Guard and guard, guard. And do it abundantly. (laughs) That's a lot of guarding. We need to guard ourselves from external influences that crowd God's word out of our heart. We're we're to fill our minds with godly things, with what God says, not with all the rubbish that our world wants us to think about. Jesus says, out of the abundance of the heart we speak. What you fill your mind with seeps into your heart and then out into your life. So guard what you put into your head, what you're putting into your heart. But we not only need to guard ourselves from external influences, but also from our internal sinful desires. You see, the strongest voice in your life isn't other people's voices, it's your own voice. The thing that we most want to listen to isn't God's word, but our own desires, what we want. Jesus says, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. If you don't guard your heart, your sinful desires and the influences of the world will wither and choke God's word in your life. Paul says to Timothy, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. The good deposit is the gospel. And we guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. Take care to guard your soul. Secondly, Moses says, don't forget the things that your eyes have seen. God's word can never be taken in isolation from God's actions. 
God's people are to listen to God's word because of what God has done for them. God had rescued them from slavery in Egypt. They had seen his power over the gods of Egypt. They had seen Pharaoh's army drowned in the Red Sea. They had seen God's provision in the 40 years of wilderness wandering. And now God was calling them to obey his words. You will never keep God's word in your heart unless you have experienced God's redeeming love in your life. Let me repeat that. You will never keep God's word in your heart unless you've experienced God's redeeming love in your life. The Apostle John reminds us that we love because he first loved us. And Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Notice the progression there. Jesus first loved us and he proved it by dying on the cross for our sins. And therefore... We love him. And if we love him, we will keep his commandments. We will listen and obey his words. It's only God's love for us in Jesus that enables us to keep his word in our heart and not only hear God's word, but do it. Before we go on to our next point, I just want to highlight a brief phrase in verse 4. Moses talks about those who held fast to the Lord your God. He's referring to those who didn't disobey God and refused to enter the promised land and died in the wilderness, but to those who continued walking with the Lord, who obeyed his word. When you listen to God's word, when you do God's word, when you don't try and change God's word, when you keep God's word in your heart, you are holding fast to the Lord your God. Holding fast to God doesn't mean you're obeying him perfectly, but that you're loyal to him, that you keep coming back to him and his word. You cannot hold fast to God without holding fast to his word, without listening to it, without obeying it, and without keeping it in your heart. So before we finish with the benefits of listening and doing God's word, I want to look at the danger of not doing God's word. In verse 3, Moses says, Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. Uh, He's referring to uh, Numbers 25, where the Moabites invited God's people to worship their God at Peor. They bowed down to their God. They committed sexual immorality with the Moabites. And in response, God destroyed 24,000 people with a plague. Now, commentators aren't certain whether this happened uh, before the 40 years or at the end of the 40 years, whether it happened to the previous generation or to the, the people Moses was preaching to in Deuteronomy. But either way, the danger of disobeying God is crystal clear. It leads to destruction. It leads to death. God says in the Garden of Eden, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. To disobey God means death. The Apostle Paul writes, the wages of sin is death. James says, sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. To not listen to God's word, to not do God's word, to change God's word, to not keep it in your heart results in death. If you don't listen to God's word, you will be forever separated from God. The Bible calls it hell, an eternity without him. That's the danger of ignoring God's word. So what what are the benefits then of doing God's word? Well, Moses gives us three. Firstly, he says, you will live. Verse one, and now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you and do them that you may live. Listening to and doing God's word is the path to life. In verse three, he mentions those who disobeyed the, the God at Peor and who died in the wilderness. 
And in verse 4 he says, But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. God preserved them because they listened and did his word. Of course, Moses' point isn't that if you do God's word, you will have a long life, but rather that life, eternal life, only comes to those who listen and do his word. I love the way Peter puts it when he says to Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. Paul and John actually call the gospel the word of life. This is the word that brings life to people. Earlier, Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes has eternal life. It's only through hearing the words of Jesus, it's only through believing the gospel that we receive eternal life. When we listen to Jesus, when we do what he says, when we keep his word in our heart, we receive eternal life. The second benefit of doing God's word is receiving the promised land. Again, verse 1. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live, and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord your God or the God of your fathers is giving you. Not only will they live by God's word, but by God's word they will receive the promised land. Now, the land that God promises us isn't Canaan. It's eternal life. It's heaven. In fact, even God's Old Testament people looked beyond the promised land to a better country. That is a heavenly one. Their ultimate reward wasn't Canaan. Their ultimate reward was to spend eternity with God in heaven. That's what Abraham was looking for. That's what Isaac wanted. That's what Jacob hoped for. That's what Joseph wanted. God's word is an invitation to not only do life with him every single day, but to come and live with him forever in heaven. Finally, doing God's word is a witness to the nations. Moses says, keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of all the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? What makes God's people so great It's not how many we are. It's not how wealthy we are. It's not how wise, but rather it's how wise we are. It's how near our God is to us. It's that we all have to call to him and he answers us. It's how righteous and good God's statutes and commands are. What's great is God's word to his people. When we do God's word, the world will, as Paul says, worship God and declare that God is really among you. When when we live out God's word, people see God in action in our lives. When we do God's word, the world witnesses God's goodness and God's greatness and God's presence with us. Brothers and sisters, if you're going to walk with the Lord, you need to start by listening to God's word. If you're going to walk with the Lord, you need to walk according to his word. You need to do what God says. If you're going to walk with the Lord, you can't go around changing the bits that you don't like. If you're going to walk with the Lord, you need to keep his word in your heart, taking care to guard your soul and remembering what God has done for you in Jesus Christ. If you ignore God's word, it will lead to death. But if you listen to God, if you do his word, if you keep it in your heart, it will lead to eternal life. It will lead you to heaven. And it will be a witness to the world of the greatness and goodness of our God. Walking with the Lord starts with his word. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us this morning.
Lord, we thank you that you don't leave yourself a mystery or uh, uh, something that we can't discover or we don't know anything about you. But Lord, you've revealed yourself to us in your word. Lord, you have told us how we can have a relationship with you. Not through our good works, but through faith in your son, Jesus, who perfectly obeyed your word before us. Lord, we thank you for the good news. And Lord, I pray this morning that we wouldn't just hear your word and walk away, but that, Lord, we would listen to you, that, Lord, we would do what you say, that, Lord, we would put our faith in your son, Jesus, that, Lord, we wouldn't chop and change your word to suit ourselves, but that, Lord, we would keep your word in our heart, that we would love it, and that you would use it to change us and make us more like your son, Jesus. Lord, we pray for those that reject your word. And Lord, we pray that in your mercy that you would open their ears and their hearts, that they would hear the good news of Jesus. And that like us, by your grace, they would receive eternal life. That they would have the hope of heaven. And Lord, we pray that we would be a witness to this world of the greatness of your word. Lord, help us live for you, that the world might see you in us. In Jesus' name. Amen.